The independent samples t-test compares one sample mean to another sample mean. It is widely used in statistics, and this will help us understand other statistical tests that we will learn about later, such as the ANOVA. The independent samples t-test, sometimes called T for two, is a parametric procedure that compares the means of two independent samples. It tests whether the means of two samples are statistically significantly different from each other. When samples are independent, that means that the scores in one sample do not influence scores in the other sample. No matter how a participant in one group performs, that performance will not affect participants in the other group. By contrast, if you were in one group and your twin was in the other group, or if you had been measured before and after an intervention, then those scores would not be independent. So imagine that we are measuring the running speed of racehorses versus cheetahs. These groups are independent because the speed of the racehorses does not influence the speed of the cheetahs. Now, if you had the cheetahs running right next to the racehorses and the horses were scared of the cheetahs, so they let the cheetahs run away, well, those scores would not be independent. Or if your cousin Vinny conspired with the cheetahs to throw the race, those scores would not be independent. In fact, you would have a confounding variable. But in our cheetahs versus racehorse example, each sample group would have a mean and each group would have a standard deviation. It will be important for our t-test that the standard deviations are approximately equal. They do not have to be the same, but they need to be close enough. And how do you know if they are close enough? We will test them with something called a Levine's test. More on that later. And just so you know the answer to who is faster, depends upon the length of the race. Cheetahs will be faster out of the gate, so they would win a short race, but they tend to tire quickly and the horses would win a longer race. Now let's look at the research design and how this would be set up with an independent sample t-test. Following the same example that I introduced to you way back with z-tests, our research question is still whether people will recall events better under hypnosis or without. Now as before, we use an existing memory test one that has been standardized on people who were not under hypnosis. Then we randomly select a group of participants. We randomly assign those participants to one of two conditions. Some will be under hypnosis, others not under hypnosis. Our independent variable is the condition, hypnotized versus not hypnotized. Our dependent variable is memory the number of words recalled. If the means of these two groups differ, we can measure how hypnosis affects memory. Do hypnotized participants remember more words than the unhypnotized participants? Now, all inferential statistics are built on certain assumptions. If your assumptions are wrong, then your conclusions could be wrong. So it is important that you check your assumptions. There are some assumptions of the independent samples t-test that you can get away with violating and others you absolutely cannot. One that absolutely must be true is that to use an independent samples t-test, you must have only two groups. No more, no less. Only two groups. The number of thy groups shall be two. The number of thy groups shall not be three. And if it is, thou shalt use a one-way ANOVA. Nor shall the numbers of thy groups be one unless thou immediately proceedest to two, only two groups for a t-test. The next non-negotiable assumption for the independent samples t-test is that the independent variable must be categorical, again, with only two groups or categories, and that the members of those two groups were randomly selected. The two groups must be either randomly assigned or naturally occurring. Randomly assigned groups are used with an experimental methodology. For instance, you randomly assign participants to be in the experimental versus the control group. Or you randomly assign participants to be in the caffeine drinking group or the no caffeine group. When naturally occurring groups are used, it is called 
quasi-experimental methodology. So for example, if you're comparing males and females, you cannot randomly assign participants to be a certain gender. You have to take people as they are. If you are studying people with cancer, you cannot randomly assign people to have cancer or not. You have to take them as they are. Now, on this next assumption, you have a little wiggle room. The sample sizes should be roughly equal. The sample sizes for each group do not have to be exactly the same, but the n should be roughly equal. So how equal is roughly equal? A good rule is that the larger sample size divided by the smaller sample size should not exceed 1.5, a roughly 60-40 split. So if 80% of your participants are in one group and 20% are in the other, or worse, 90-10, you need to fix that. So what can you do? I had one researcher bring me a data set that was this 90-10 split. It was way too uneven. Fortunately, however, that 10% group was still fairly large, over 60 people. So I was able to do a random sample of the larger control group, letting the software randomly select 60 people who then became our comparison group. Now there are other possible solutions. You could do bootstrapping, in which you use software to do a form of sampling for you. If you are still pre-data collection, you could do stratified random sampling, in which you collect data on the larger comparison group, but then stop collecting data once you have enough participants. Meanwhile, you are still continuing to collect data on the smaller group until you have enough participants. You could set up a matched samples design in which you purposefully pair similar individuals in those two groups. Or you could do propensity score matching of the participants in the two groups if you have the right quality of data. Talk to your statistician if sample size is an issue for you. A fourth assumption of the independent samples t-test that cannot be violated is that the dependent variable must be at the scale level. The dependent variable must be measuring something. It's quantitative, either at the scale level or using Likert scale survey data, as long as you have at least five answer options. If you have two groups, but a categorical dependent variable, you would use the chi-square test. The scale level data for the dependent variable is established when you establish your research methodology. So you should choose a data collection instrument or a survey or a measurement that will give you scale level data. You should also check your dependent variable when you do data cleaning. And data cleaning is the time to make absolutely certain that your variables are scored correctly. For instance, if you are using a survey with items that are reverse scored, in other words, you need to change high values to low values, then make sure that the items on your scale have been coded in the same direction. On the other hand, there are some assumptions for the independent samples t-test in which you do have some more flexibility or wiggle room. The test assumes that you do not have extreme outliers. If you have outliers, you can fix that by removing them, or better yet, Windsorizing them to the next highest reasonable value. The independent samples t-test assumes that the samples are independent. Independent means that the scores in one sample do not influence the probability of scores in the other sample. The samples cannot be related, or the scores influencing each other. If the samples are related, then you will use a paired samples t-test. The sampling distribution of the dependent variable should be normally distributed. So the dependent variable should be drawn from a population whose sample means are normally distributed. Assuming the other assumptions are met, this is not an issue, especially if your sample size is greater than 30. See the video on the central limit theorem for more details. The last assumption that you should check is that the populations represented by the dependent variable have homogeneity of variance. Homogeneity of variance means that the variance in each group is of the same nature, 
or the two groups have the same kind of variance. Like sample size, the variance does not have to be exactly equal, just close enough. So how do you know if your variance is close enough to be homogeneous or not? We use something called Levine's test for equality of variances to determine if the variance in the two groups is similar enough to be of the same kind. If it is not, then we have to apply a correction factor when interpreting the independent samples t-test. Because this assumption is so important, we need to look more closely at Levine's test for equality of variances. Now, the upshot of all of this is that the independent samples t-test is robust. Robust means that the type 1 error rate does not increase if the assumptions are violated. The independent samples t-test is robust to violations of normality or homogeneity as long as there is a minimum of 30 subjects in each sample group. Here are the settings for null hypothesis significance testing. The null hypothesis is that the sample means equal the population mean, or said more accurately, each sample is drawn from the same population, or drawn from populations whose means are equal. So here is how you would write your null hypothesis. H sub zero, colon, mu one equals mu two, which is the same as writing mu one minus mu two equals zero. The alternative hypothesis would be H sub one, colon, mu one does not equal mu two. The alpha level, is typically set to an alpha of 0.05, but it could be set to 0.01 or another level chosen by the researcher. The degrees of freedom for separate samples are N1 minus 1 plus N2 minus 1, which would be the same as N1 plus N2 minus 2. The critical value is determined based upon your degrees of freedom and alpha level. You will look up the critical value in student's t-distribution table, which is available on the last page of your notes. So you can assume that the t-test is alpha equals 0.05, two-tailed test, unless you have been told otherwise. The nature of the independent samples t-test tells us a little bit about what is being done with this test. Mathematically, the independent samples t-test is the same thing as one single sample t-test minus another single sample t-test. Let's look at that. First, we need a single sample t-test. That is our starting point. Good. Now we need a second single sample t-test. Same as the first. So let's subtract the second single sample t-test from the first. And notice what we've done here. To subtract the two tests, we just did some algebra. We combined the two sample means to subtract them. We combined the two population means to subtract them. Then in the denominator, we pooled the two variance terms. Now we already know how to find sample means. We can calculate them, the sum of x divided by n. The same is true for the sample standard deviations. We could calculate those as well. But this numerator reads, quantity of mean 1 minus mean 2 minus mu 1 minus mu 2. Now where are we going to get the values for mu 1 and mu 2? To answer that, let's return to our null hypothesis. The null hypothesis for an independent samples t-test states that the two samples are drawn from populations with the same mean. In our case, all of the sample participants were drawn from the same population. Therefore, both samples should have the same means. So mu1 and mu2 are equal. So what if we subtract two values that are equal? If we assume that mu1 equals mu2, as is stated by our null hypothesis, then mu1 minus mu2 would equal zero. Therefore, the value mu1 minus mu2 in the numerator equals zero, and so can be ignored. 
the numerator will include only mean 1 minus mean 2. The final formula for the independent samples t-test, therefore, will be this. m1 equals the mean of the first sample, m sub 2 equals the mean of the second sample, and that error term is the standard error of the difference, which is computed with pooled variance. And that will require a little more explaining before we use it.